All right, today we are going to look at what I would call emerging trends in uh, real estate for 2021. So hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Today is the 7th of January. We'll be having some in-depth look at some major markets across the U.S., um, a lot of data out there. I'm reviewing a report that was produced recently, and um, we'll sort of get into it. So first of all, if you're not already a subscriber, if you could please do me a favor and smash that subscriber button, I'd really appreciate that. Help my channel grow and keep me inspired to be bringing you the realism in real estate, because I'm Randy Patrick, and that's what I do. We talk about facts, we look at trends, we look at opportunities. We get rid of the fluff and we debunk the housing narratives that are going on out there. All right, guys. So today um, we're going to look at something neat. So um, I look at investor trends. And what I mean by that is when you see where investors are going or where they're planning to go or what they're planning to do, chances are they've done some research and they've got maybe a little more intel than the average uh, folk do that are out there and they spent the time and effort to do that so i tend to like to listen and and hear what they have to say and figure out what they're doing so really it's an interesting article in mpa um org.com and what boils down to um you know you know there's what what can you do in 2021 with respect to i guess you could say emerging trends and real estate investment opportunities and this will mirror just your, your primary home buyers, what you should look for and what you should do and where you should go as well, too. That's why I say we need to look at where investors are sort of putting their efforts and concentrating their 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 activities. Well, in the end, it boils down to with respect to commercial stuff, the commercial market's taking a beating. Clearly, things like hospitality, uh, malls, retail, lodging, hotels are, are really getting hurt. What's not getting hurt um, right now, I mean, sure, there's always, obviously going to be some you know, delays with the rental and stuff, but the, you know, the multifamily isn't as decimated as people thought it would be. So that's quite interesting. But what people are, are or investors are saying right now is basically single family, you know, residential SFR. So, you know, how you can use the single family rental market to win in 2021. Really, single family residential homes right now have higher returns than multifamily. Single family is a perfect avenue for institutional. So the big you know, Uber investors, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, and mom and pop, which is everyday people like us, uh, to invest in residential uh, real estate. So that's the opportunity right now. And, you know, when we've taken a look at what's happened this year uh, with COVID and, and some of the price points, I mean, you know, people are relocating from the urban centers. People are going to more suburbia and more rural, which, of course, this is where the single families are concentrated. Uh, also, people are preferring to have space with respect to being away from other people. So they don't want the density, number one. And number two, if you're working from home or that's going to be a, a sort of an ongoing trend as time goes on, then clearly they want you know, a, a look at the lifestyle or, or setting up their home office or, or how they communicate with people in a, a less, you know, a little more, we'll call it acceptable environment to their standards or what they want to do. So this is kind of where we are. So basically, single family is going to continue to mean to become a hot or, or, or to remain a hot investment opportunity. And, and really, it's how you, you can get into it is the question or what you can do at least get a primary home. So um, I'm looking at information here produced by PricewaterhouseCoopers and Urban Land Institute. Every year, they put together a, an emerging trends in real estate document. It's usually 100 and plus pages. I think it's 117 pages, this one. And they take a look at the U.S. and Canada, which is great. But today, we're just going to focus on the U.S. And listen, there's a lot to look at here. This, th this reviews single family, um, all sorts of commercial, but we're just going to focus on single family and where, you know, where the, you know, the an the analysts sort of say, you know, the focus is going to be or the opportunities are going to lie. So let's check it out here. So ultimately, and, um, you know, we know that people have been moving and this is, you know, called the Great American Move. This is produced by John Burns Real Estate Consulting. Um, they're using the U-Haul information as kind of a, you know, the starting point for this. But if we bring it up a little closer here, um, you know, home buyers in the move, U-Haul migration patterns. And essentially the, the red dots are where people are leaving and the green dots are where people are, where people are moving to. And I guess um, ultimately if you're renting a U-Haul truck or trailer, if you're going one way, um, it, there's actually a premium to bring it to some of these green dot locations, all right? And what I mean by that, if you're leaving, you know, 
uh, Portland for Salt Lake City. Well, there's more people leaving than coming in, so therefore U-Haul doesn't want to be stuck with all their transportation vehicles and trailers, you know, in Salt Lake City uh, because they'll have less of them available in Portland. You see, for example, so there's a premium. Uh, I'm sure they must trailer them back or, or deliver them around to locations that need to be restocked. But the point is, you know, we, this is where the trends are going. So clearly, we've got people leaving the West Coast, going to Boise, Salt Lake City, Phoenix. Um, we've got people leaving Denver. We've got people leaving Minneapolis, Chicago. Coming to the South, it's really Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth, Metro, Austin, San Antonio, Te uh, Houston, Texas. Um, we look at the uh, Midwest. We've got Indianapolis uh, as being a hub now. People are leaving the Northeast, the New York area, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, and where they're coming to the South. Uh, Raleigh, Charlotte, Nashville, Atlanta, Charleston, Myrtle Beach, Jacksonville, Florida, Orlando, Tampa, Sarasota, Fort Myers. So we can see that the trend is really going inland from the coast and going south, whether that's cost basis or cost and uh, tax or cost tax and, and um temperature or lifestyle. I mean, there's obviously a number of factors that people will choose when they move and relocate, but it's interesting to see where where stuff's going or where people are going. So markets to watch. This 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 report from PricewaterhouseCoopers essentially is identifying the markets to watch and, and to maybe get involved with if that's something you want to do. Their comment up here, the pandemic has been an equalizer. Our focus is on identifying the markets that will lead in the next normal. What that next normal is, who knows? It basically is how the COVID trend will, will shape us. Again, I'm not a proponent. I'm going to comment on whether you believe it or not, but we just know that regardless of what's happening in, in our, our um, you know, social economic uh, living environment, um, you know, you got to figure it out and you got to and you got to roll with the punches, essentially. So, you know, figure it out and, and move on it. So um, they got a really great report here. And, you know, they take a look. The two columns on the left are overall real estate prospects and you got home building prospects, the markets to watch. Now, I'm just going to look at the overall real estate prospects in, for the sake of time and effort here. And I'm going to blow it up on the next slide. So hang in with me here. And uh, if you want this information, um, I'll produce this in a sort of a PDF slide format and just email me. Uh, and I'll send it to you if you can, because I know it's tough to see with the colors and everything. But what it boils down to is, is this, is that you take a look at the overall real estate prospects. And obviously the, the dark green are the, the, the better, you know, the higher median ones. And then, you know, you got your mid green and you got your sort of lighter green. Uh, and really it, it boils down to uh, overall prospects are probably, you know, primary home investor opportunities, commercial as well, too. So when we take a look at that, you got, you know, your top sort of tier of prospects are the Raleigh, Durham area. Austin, Texas, Nashville, Dallas, Fort Worth, Charlotte, Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg, Salt Lake City, Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, Boston, Long Island, Atlanta, San Antonio. That's your, your sort of top ones. The next sort of, you know, looks like a next from 13 to 64 is kind of spread all over the country here. You got Denver, the Jersey area, Phoenix, Cape Coral, Fort Myers, Naples area, Inland Empire, Orange County of um, California, Boise, Idaho, Washington, D.C., Indianapolis, Philadelphia, Charleston, Orlando, Columbus, Greenville. I mean, you get you get what I'm looking at here. And then on the other side, the sort of the, the low end, you got New Orleans, Buffalo, Providence, Memphis, Baltimore, Knoxville, Louisville, Oklahoma City. So I don't know whether that's based on economic issues or, or what's trending there, but you know, clearly you got you know your overall interest and opportunities of the dark green. Less of them are are you know the less interest or the less overall opportunities you're going to find are the, are the lighter green and then everything in between. But, you know, again, I'm not going to go over all 80 of these locations, but if you take a look at the concentration and what we're seeing here is that clearly certain states are leading the pack. So quick summary, well, North Carolina had number one and number five, which was Raleigh, Durham area, and Charlotte. Florida, you had a whack of them, right? I mean, listen, you, everything in Florida is Tampa, St. Petersburg, and the Cape Coral area, Orlando, you got Miami and Jacksonville, and you've got you know, locations like um, Tallahassee and Gainesville, which are, you know, college towns. Tallahassee has Florida State University. Gainesville has University of Florida. So you've got, you know, different different areas that I guess you could say um, are not necessarily top tier cities, but they're growth opportunities. And with growth opportunities mean, you know, opportunity for investment, whether that's short term student housing, uh, supporting the universities uh, with other rental accommodation or, or buying and selling homes that, you know, the profs and, 
and the university workers need to live in, so things like that. Obviously, the greater New York area, which, you, which you've got, you know, the Long Island. Now, I know on Long Island, one of the things that we've realized is that, you know, the Suffolk County and, and Nassau, Nassau County has the most concentration of pre-foreclosure properties. you got a boatload, like I think over 15,000. Uh, that last video I did in, you know, doing the top 10 or not the top, the top foreclosure locations across the country, which I do need to still, I've got two more videos that are coming, just hadn't had a chance to do them. I got to do the California and then the rest of the country. Uh, but that New York area, just that whole greater New York area with Long Island being, you know, 16,000 plus on Long, Long Island. And you've got the, you know, the, the various boroughs and or counties in New York. And then you've got, you know, the Connecticut area, et cetera, West, Westfield, Connecticut and New Haven, Hartford, the whole bit, that whole greater New York area has a ton of opportunity. California, well, we're looking at California here, Inland Empire, right, which is more of the inland area. I think it, I think it's the Fresno type, you know, middle of the of the, of the county, Orange County, or we're middle of the state, you got Orange County. Um, you look at the LA area, you know, San Diego, San Jose, uh, Oakland, East Bay, San Francisco. So all of these locations are going to have their pros and cons. Um, but you can see that, you know, where we have, you know, you know, quick, clear, a lot of opportunities are in growth cities. Uh, look at the D.C. area. You've got Washington, Maryland, Balt, you know, the Washington boroughs or, or burbs, however they're laid out, because I know what's very concentrated there. You've got Baltimore as well, too. Um, you've got Texas, Texas being Austin, Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth area, um, San Antonio area and, and Houston. So there's a ton of opportunity all over here. But you know, these are kind of like to me the the the, the greater concentration of opportunities in these states, which, you know, if you take a look at it, you know, it doesn't, doesn't surprise me that we do have, you know, some of the southern states going on here. And, and listen, the states that had one, you know, the one one on, on this list of 80, I'm not going to throw it on there to speak, but, you know, we, we just see concentration in certain locations, which to me um, kind of reminds me of where the last housing crisis were oh, and, and or the beneficiaries and stuff like that. So it doesn't surprise me. Uh, you know, we're going to have south areas. We're going to have relocation areas. You're going to follow um, that U-Haul relocation map, etc. Now, it, it's but when you look at this, it's like, okay, this is, you know, overall real estate prospects, which are, which are a combination of a number of things. Um, however, they, they break stuff down into these subgroup and market categories. So we'll spend a bit of time now talking about that. And so the major groups, they're called the first major group, a magnet location, all right? And a magnet location are, are basically saying almost all the markets in the magnet category are growing more quickly than the U.S. average. So really, they're looking at growth patterns. And, you know, if you're thinking about it, you know, if, it's, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to work in a growing location, how are you going to... How are you going to figure out your housing needs? If you want to invest in a growing location, you know how, what what trends are you going to look at, and what sort of investment opportunities are you going to review to see how you can earn income and and and, and cash flow, etc. So there's just different ways of looking at things. But basically, these are growing more than the U.S. average, and since they are both magnets for people and companies, the first group is what they call the super sun belt. Markets are still affordable for business and residents, even while these powerhouse economies have attracted and will continue to attract a wide range of businesses. Among the, all are among the top 10 fastest growing cities in the United States, with 16% of emerging trends in um, the universe's population. The super sunbelt markets will generate 28% of its new jobs between 2019 and 2025. Two sunbelt markets, the Dallas-Fort Worth market and the Tampa market, are ranked in the top 10 for overall real estate prospects, Reflecting the draw of markets in this category. Well, clearly, we know that you know Texas and you know obviously the um, Dallas Fort Worth area is recipient of a lot of people coming from the tech world, a lot of people from California relocating, and obviously where I'm in here in the Tampa St. Petersburg area, we're seeing a lot of a lot of people moving in here, a lot of a development going on in our downtown core, and a lot of new construction in, in, in suburbia, as well as a lot of investor concentration. And just as an FYI, I mean, I really see, you know, if I've reached out to you before or you've reached out to me and we've talked about, you know, the Tampa market here, I suggest maybe you revisit your discussions with me because I just, um, uh, you know, we're, we're marketing for the pre-foreclosure stuff now. We're marketing for people who are facing the foreclosure sales with, with the system that I implement in our little, I call our sort of unique stuff that we do to to help out these homeowners. And we're starting, you know, we, you know, basically things are happening now in the new year. Things are opening up. So we're now, we're getting people to call us, which is really positive. Also, I've just nailed down a, um, uh, we'll call it off market um, bank owned, you know, um, we'll call it source 
uh, that we've just sort of engaged and we'll start to see some bank-owned property. And again, uh, these are things you don't find on the MLS. This is all relationship buildings and stuff and, and contacts and just basically co constantly mining for opportunities, which is what I do. So essentially, so I mean, I, I like to repeat the same words clearly, but so what I'm saying here is essentially, um, you know, if you've kind of dusted me off or not interested, you may want to revisit this, okay? Because uh, what I'm saying to you is that there's going to be a lot of opportunities, locations, and I'm starting to get tied in even deeper to where things are at. That's kind of the Super Sunbelt stuff here. So, so focus groups, participants in the Super Sunbelt markets provide the following insights. So, you know, essentially the Super Sunbelt is Atlanta, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Phoenix, San Antonio, Tampa, St. Petersburg. So basically they're looking at some of these locations having you know, really highly educated workers and um, you could say you know good concentration of universities and colleges and you know different lower cost of living etc so that's what we're looking at here now you got the second part of the magnet it's called these 18 hour cities and this category is um, I guess you could say 18 hour cities are popular um, in migration destinations due to lifestyle culture and employment opportunities they are not necessarily inexpensive markets but they are more affordable than the establishment markets which we'll talk about in a second here and that's why they draw many newcomers so you got the 18 hour cities uh, which basically is austin charlotte denver minneapolis nashville portland raleigh durham salt lake san diego seattle i think what they mean by the 18 hour cities is that you know it's it's vibrant working community and they've probably got a, a vibrant nightlife okay so things to do like austin and charlotte and um, raleigh and things like that you know, salt lake city so Stuff going on, you know, you've got work and play happening at the same time, right? So that's very interesting. And um, basically, you know, uh, some of these are not necessarily mega cities, but they, they've got a lot of diversity and a lot of things to offer. Now, the last part of the madness is called the Sunshine State, which basically uh, Tampa was not in the Sunshine State, even though it's in the Sunshine State. The grouping, they put them in the Super Sun Belt. The Sunshine State is, is Lauderdale, Jacksonville, Miami, and West Palm Beach. Essentially, Miami up to West Palm is one big chunk. It's three counties. You got Miami, Dade, Broward County, and what and Palm Beach County, and then you go up a little bit farther. You got the Jacksonville area. So they're, they're looking at the Sunshine State as being, um, I guess, these four East Coast Florida markets have substantial and varied economic bases. Job growth in all four um, of the locate locales has been and is forecast to be above the U.S. average. And three South Florida markets have science, technology engineering and mathematics scores almost double the U.S. Uh, average. That stands for STEM. So if you ever hear about STEM type of, you know, um, education or STEM type of in investment or, or, or companies, that's what we got going on there. Um, I guess you could say you got hospital hospitality investors. We're concerned with climate resilience in Southeast Florida. Um, South and Central Florida benefit from long term. Uh, we'll benefit long term from, you know, we've got um, more transit being developed and there's train lines and stuff of like that that are planned. So uh, the market is growing. Florida is one of the you know the top locations. People are, are, are I guess you could say flocking to, and each each location has its opportunities. Now clearly, um, I'm in the Tampa St. Petersburg location, but I can serve some of this as well too. So in case you're looking at that, the next group is called the establishment. All right, and we'll talk about that. So the establishment boils down to uh, metro areas of Boston, Chicago, L.A., New York. Philadelphia and the Bay Area of, of, of California and Washington have been among the country's biggest and most influential cities for over a century. Although Dallas and Houston have caught up popula population-wise, these established markets of economic, government, and cultural powerhouses provided real estate investment and development redevelopment opportunities for quite some time. So the, the multi-talented metro areas basically have kind of a bit of everything. The Boston, Chicago, LA, the New York, Brooklyn area, the New York, Manhattan area, Philadelphia. Basically, you've got... You know, you've got good universities, good job opportunities, a lot of immigration, a lot of stuff happening in these locations, job prospects, the whole bit. So that's why they are the multi-talented metro areas. They attract a lot of people um, going to those regions for, for various opportunities. Interesting. The specialized uh, economies, uh, those closely include the link markets of Oakland, um, East Bay, San Francisco, San Jose, Washington, D.C. District. And I guess why they're so interesting is the fact that you know it's leading government market globally, STEM location quotients, um, I guess you could say tech concentration, things like that. So some of these locations have high housing costs, which could slow but not derail growth. Um, all full area, all Bay Area focus per group participants point to a housing affordability crisis, 
that is further challenged by people seeing multifamily as undesirable. So basically, um, you know, this is what's going on in these locations. People are, you know, maybe leaving multifamily and going to more of the urban areas that surround these um, specialized economy locations. Suburbs ascending. So what that means here is, is the fact that um, there's suburbs to the bigger locations, right? The suburbs to LA and New York and Washington. And, you know, um, I guess you could say that um, they've moved up the rankings of overall real estate prospects compared to last year uh, due to the COVID influence desire to move away from the metro or urban locations into more public and private space. Um, you know, so again, it's just one of those things where you've got Inland Empire, Jersey City, Long Island, New York, other boroughs, northern New Jersey, Orange County, um, you know, outside of L.A., uh, the Westchester area in Connecticut, in New York and, and Fairfield, Connecticut, Washington, D.C., Maryland suburbs, Washington, D.C., northern Virginia. So people who are saying, hey, I want to get out of the out of the um, we'll call it the, the, the more concentrated locations. They're hitting the suburbs of these large cities, which in turn is causing them to grow, but also create real estate opportunity for other people. So uh, it's one of those things where I think what, what we're seeing here is we're seeing wealth transfer, we're seeing relocation, we're seeing people with lifestyle uh, desires or, or needs that are transferring. So you're going to see some markets changing, you know, their perspective. Uh, markets will ebb and flow. Some markets will decrease in value or have more listing opportunities or purchase opportunities, but other, other markets will not. Uh, but so it's just a shift. So, you know, eventually, People will move back or the new set of buyers move back to these big cities and stuff like that. So that's kind of, you know, where we're looking at right now. But it's interesting to see how everything's going to play out with respect to what's happened the past year in 2020. Now we're into what's called the niche market or as you people down here like to say niches, niche. Um, as, as I say, there's the there's riches in the niches, right? Um, anyway, they may the niche markets, niche markets may not be as economically diverse as the multi-talented markets are. But they have a dominant economic driver that supports stable economic growth, which is really cool. So the bo boutique markets uh, support uh, our smaller cities with innovative or unique developments that coordinate well with their economic and demographic uh, or profile. So like a Boise, Idaho, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Des Moines, Iowa, Greenville, South Carolina, Knoxville, Tennessee, um, Omaha, Portland, Maine, Richmond, Virginia. So you know, I think there are more. Those are more interesting cities that are offering some lifestyle things plus some stable e economies. People are going to. Are going to are going to I guess they focus there or flock there. Um, the Eds and Meds Eds and Meds tend to be locations that do have maybe um, you know it's basically large universities or a lot of uh, education plus um, growth in, in healthcare markets and things like that. So you know clearly you know you're going to have research and development in locations you know like Baltimore, Columbus, Gainesville, Madison, Wisconsin, Tallahassee, Pittsburgh, Memphis. So where you're seeing you know, significant universities and, and growth and research there, you're going to see um, growth in property requirements and opportunities in the Eds and Meds niche as well, too. Now, visitor and convention centers, clearly, you know, we're looking at here at the Cape Coral, Fort Myers, that's, it's, you know, snowbird heaven, Charleston, um, South Carolina, Deltona, Daytona Beach on the east coast of Florida, Honolulu, obviously in Hawaii, Vegas, we know Vegas is all about, New Orleans as well, too, um, People coming down there for for opportunities and and, and, and fun and etc. Orlando, big you know driver of um, you know visitors and conventions. Virginia Beach, Norfolk as well too. So what we're looking at here is that um, tourism dependent and um, meetings and businesses and whatever. So I guess um, you know we'll see how that works out. And um, but there's going to be some I won't call them difficulties, but you're going to have you know, what's being closed or open in hospitality and hotels? What's What about airline travel opportunities? So these are locations people want to go to, uh, you know, but can they get there? Um, you know, what's happening in that local market, et cetera. So, I mean, a lot of stuff's changing, but again, another niche you can take a look at or niche. Um, I, I'm about 90 minutes or, you know, hour and a bit from Orlando and at least the west part of it. So I know that when I hit that, the first area is International Drive and golf courses and the Disney location. So I know, you know, there's there's opportunity there. A lot of Europeans actually own, uh, they have, they, they take their summer vacations for six weeks in the Orlando area as well, too. So just stuff happening out there. So again, everything is changing. Uh, but, you know, they're people, but what they're saying here is that's, you know, emerging trends to look at here. Now, the backbone markets um, really are, um, not all markets rank high in what's called the national surveys, but many are interesting and enjoyable places to live and work with targeted opportunities for investment and development and redevelopment. Uh, we have labeled these backbone markets 
Um, you know, all, some 18 cities comprising more than 32 million residents. Although they were generally, generally slower growth markets, they're also among the most affordable markets in the U.S. in terms of housing and business costs. So this, you know, could be your your you know where you want to move to um, to have better pricing or where you want to invest to have um, stable you know cash flow things like that. So the affordable West is really basically uh, locations that are not in your major hubs. You got your Albuquerque's, your Sacramento, Tacoma, Washington. Tucson, Arizona, Spokane, uh, and Coeur um, Idaho, that kind of right on the, on the border there. So that's, you know, more affordable than a Seattle, more affordable than, you know, uh, San Francisco area, Sacramento would be. So that's, uh, you know, attractive to people. The determined competitors are diverse markets having success and reinvigorating their downtowns and neighborhoods. Uh, these markets tend to be strong ancillary, ancillary locations. Uh, we, so you got Birmingham, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Missouri, Louisville, Oklahoma City. So again, they're, they're um, stable, easy to do business and affordable with lots of business migration from Illinois uh, coming down from the uh, at least the Midwest there. So that's interesting to see. Um, you know, basically, for example, Kansas City is a two day truck drive to 88 percent of the U.S. population. So a lot of this could be re regional positioning with respect to business opportunities and growth. And then the reinventing. So the reinventing are basically. I look at these locations, and when I see them, I, I look at you know um, locations that maybe had a tougher time in the last housing crisis, didn't grow or get the property uh, values coming up since then. Uh, maybe had some downtown core issues and um, some other blights, uh, you know, that that were part of the housing crisis. But now they're reinventing. Buffalo, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Detroit, Hartford, Milwaukee, Providence, Rhode Island, St. Louis. So I can tell you that a lot of these locations have a significant amount of pre foreclosures. So as much as maybe they're reinventing themselves with and, and regions and cities and locations do that. I mean, you know, it, it becomes it needs some development. It, it come, maybe needs some demolition, maybe needs some gentrification. But in the end, you know, if you start looking at these locations, like I, for example, I, I took a look at Buffalo because I'm, you know, originally from an hour north of the border, an hour and 10 minutes north of Buffalo, drive-wise. And I was surprised at the number of pre-foreclosures that were in a Buffalo, in Buffalo. To me, I didn't think there'd be that many there, but there's quite a bit. And knowing kind of the city, it's like, you know what, this is not a bad location. Um, you know, rents are reasonable. And, you know, it's almost like if you're, if you're going farther down the line um, with respect to um, not as high price, You've got more affordable real estate investment opportunities, or just more affordable homes. Um, you're you're going to do well there, just because of the opportunity. So we know Cleveland has a ton of pre foreclosures, thousands of them. We know that um, you know going Detroit has their their problems with the downtown core and the, and the pre foreclosure issues and very very um, cheap price property. I know Hartwood, Hartford and part of that Connecticut area um, has got ton of um, pre foreclosures, and same with St. Louis. And going across the river on the Illinois side of, of St. Louis as well, too. A lot of free foreclosure properties there, too. So as the year goes on, a lot of this is going to manifest and it's going to come out. And, you know, the, the opportunities to pick up things at auctions or pre foreclosure or REOs, real estate owned, will be made available. And, you know, you would think that the price points would reflect what's going on in those locations. But I look at it going, don't wait for it to happen. Jump on it now. But again, that, so that's how they're category, categorizing this the country in this market, which I do think is kind of interesting. So um, obviously this is local market perspective investor demand. I'll blow this, you know, investor demand and then redevelopment. I'm just going to look at investor demand right now because it would take too long. Obviously this is a, already a longer video. So I look at the investor demand. You know, this is where people or investors are, are, are going to, you know, that's where they want to buy property. Now whether it's, um, it could be all types of property, whether it's single family homes or multifamily or retail or office or warehouse, industrial, whatever, self-storage, uh, fulfillment, you know, for example, um, like an Amazon. Amazon needs a fulfillment center, in, you know, in various regions to service what's going on in their customer base. So that's kind of things that are happening. But you take a look at clearly Texas is up there. you got Austin being the number one investor demand, Dallas, Fort Worth, Nashville, Charlotte, Boston, Raleigh, Durham, Atlanta, Denver, Long Island area. Seattle, Inland Empire, Fort Lauderdale, you know, you can go down Cape Coral, Fort Myers, LA, Phoenix, Salt Lake City, you know, San Diego, Tampa, St. Petersburg. Now, we're seeing kind of a shift like these, these kind of 80 cities might be in a different order with respect to the overall real estate prospects because they're the two different kind of thought process here. But 
when you take a look at you know the the bottom right, uh, the the right column and the bottom right, you know that's kind of like more of a burnt orange coloring. That's the, maybe the least demand. But but look, Detroit, New Orleans, Buffalo, Milwaukee, Memphis, Albuquerque. Well, if we go to one of the previous slides, it talked about the we'll call it the. Um, well, let me take a quick look here. <laughs> Hang on. Um, let me go to the slide here. Um, the reinventing markets. Funny enough, you got Buffalo, uh, Milwaukee, you know, Detroit, um, things like that. Um, you know, going on there. You know, so that's it's almost like the less investor demand right now could uh, equate to better home prices, better real estate overall pricing, and maybe a resurgent invest investor demand as time goes on. So that's the thing. So clearly, if you're working in an Austin, Texas market where there's a lot of investor demand, uh, a lot of people moving there and relocating, it's going to be brisk, but there's going to be a lot more competition. So everything's going to be you know, that much more inflated price wise, where if you're going to a Buffalo, New York, um, you know, you're able to, there's maybe not as much investor demand, but there's still be demand for housing uh, as, as it grows. And if you're in the, on the ground floor, and, and you're able to get opportunities much cheaper, which is better for risk, better for rental accommodation, better for fixing stuff, whatever it is. So the, the whole point I'm saying is that um, you can take a look at this and kind of figure out, you know, where investors are going and where should you go. So, so should you go in the number one location to invest? Well, it might be hard to do that. It might be more expensive. It might be very competitive. You might be frustrated. Should you go to a mid-tier location? You know, like a San Antonio, like a uh, Madison, Wisconsin, or, or you know, um, Birmingham, Alabama. You know, right? So it just depends on what, what you want to do and how you want to take a look at things. But again, again, I put this all in perspective of what's happening. So where people are re relocating, where industry, where industry is going, um, where we have favorable housing uh, laws, where government is not participating heavily in some of the housing markets as well, too. I think that's important. We'll talk about that in a future video. Uh, but you can see sort of where the demand is or where they project it's going to be. So again, this is produced by PricewaterhouseCoopers and the Urban Land Institute. And, and this is uh, their you know, 2021 emerging market. So it's their perspective of where things could be happening. It's 117 pages. So I just took sort of the highlights out of this just so I could show people going, you know, you might want to think about these locations because there could be some upside for either primary home, relocation, rental property, um, other investments, etc. So just take that with a grain of salt. But again, it's just neat, neat to see what is going on and, and where uh, some of the, the analysts think will be opportunities in the future. Now, we all know the housing market is manipulated and managed right now. Uh, we know this. We have you know high, high prices, low inventory, uh, interest rates dropped again the other day. So each time they drop, it almost like they hit a new record. So we know this. The point is we have to figure this out. We have to work through it to get to our real estate goals and needs. Now, there are properties available right now. There's more coming online. You just have to know where to look, and, and it's always in the distressed sales area, so you got to keep that in mind. As I mentioned, I'm seeing some new trends out there. Um, I, I'm getting an idea of what's sort of working in, 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 to make money in real estate, whether it's income, cash flow, whatever. I, I certainly see in my area of, of Florida here, other parts of Florida, other parts of the U.S., what things are, are opportunistic. Uh, I just I mentioned earlier, um, I will be getting access to a lot of off-market REO. These are stuff, and when I say off-market, these are things that are not on the MLS. They're not on FISBO. They're not on the MLS. You know, they're from sources, and basically, when when we get them, we uh, they show them to us, and we negotiate price, and we check out the property. And we try to put them with a buyer. And what I typically do is I have kind of my, we'll call it um, preferred buyer list, people I've dealt with before, people who I, I've engaged in certain, we'll call it ways, et cetera. And that's you know who gets crack at these first before I sort of work my way down the line. But so the point is, if you want to be in that kind of world, uh, drop me a line, let me know. Uh, because again, I, I, we have a number of things that we're doing and I can tell you about what's happening. Just connect with me. It's my email there. Send me your information. I know I've talked to a lot of people this week. And I have a lot. I have a lot to get to get to still. So I apologize. I'll be working on that over the next couple of days. I'm always available over the weekend. So you can give me a call or, or hook up. Uh, meet with me. Whatever you need to do. So um, once again, thank you for your views, for the likes and comments. Please share the video with your family and friends. Help it get more traction. And also, if you're not an already subscriber, help my channel grow. Please and thank you. And smash that subscribe button. We'll look forward to speaking with you in a few days. Thanks very much.